would like to welcome everyone to our global webinar related to fraud investigation technique. Today, we have a very special speaker with us opening this program. And who is better than Mr. John Gill? He actually joined the ACFE more than 25 years ago. Now, I think he's celebrating 25 anniversary with the ACFE. And he started with the ACFE in the research department. And now he is actually the vice president of education. Mr. John, he had contributed so many things to us in the fraud examination domain. He is the co-author of the Fraud Examiner's Manual, which is, we call it the, uh, the anti-fraud Bibles for us to understand how can we deal with fraud investigation. He is the co-instructor on the CFE exam review course, and he is actually the chief, uh, uh, the editor-in-chief for the CFE exam. So in that way, if you wonder who actually was responsible for the CFE exam and all the questions that you got in the exam, and he is actually responsible for the CFE exam preparation course that we use to teach our uh, CFE exam review courses. Also, he's contributing author for the Fraud Magazine. And he is actually have delivered amazing training over the last 25 years. And with that, I will give the mic to uh, uh, Mr. John. Yeah, thank you very much. That was a very kind introduction. I did notice on the title slide where I'm not just a guest speaker, but a special guest speaker. So I uh, appreciate that. That means uh, somehow I'm extra special. I have been with ACV uh, since 1995, coming up on my 25th anniversary. It was a lot smaller then. We had about 25 employees and we had about 12 to 13,000 members worldwide. And if you had told me in 1995 that we would have 85,000 members across the world, or that I would be sitting here 25 years later doing a presentation where more than 5,000 people across the globe would be watching, I would never have believed it in a million years. But uh, Joseph Wells, who is our founder, he had a really good idea. And so that's why I, I've stayed with him for 25 years is because I think he came up with such a, a brilliant idea and a brilliant program. And so we have all tried very hard to, to follow uh, in his footsteps. He still comes into the office, he's still involved, but he's kind of turned over the reins to the rest of us. So thank you all for being here. As I was watching the chat come up, I was really struck by how many people from so many different areas. It, it really is, it really is mind boggling to know that, first of all, that there's the technology that allows all of us to be on one call talking about this. That just, uh, to me, as let's say a mid fifties uh, individual, that's, uh, that's just incredible, but just from the, the number of different countries. I will also say it makes me a little sad because I like to travel. So this has been a good uh, job for me. I was looking at all the places coming up and I was reminiscing about uh, the places that I had been and places that I really want to see. So I have been extremely lucky to see people from India. I've been to India, China, mainland China, Hong Kong, uh, Malaysia, Singapore, Oman, I saw some people from Oman and Jordan, I've been there, Bahrain. It's, I love traveling and I love meeting people from all different countries. In South America, I've been to Mexico, Chile, uh, all, all over Europe, Portugal and Spain and um, uh, Scotland and the UK in uh, England and so, I love to travel. I have really enjoyed that as part of this job. And thank you all for making time, no matter what time of day it is where you're at, to come and listen to this. So, so let's get started. Yeah, we can go to the, the first slide. So I'm gonna start, instead of just jumping into, you know, well, what should we do first? What's the first step? A lot of times the first step is going to be, well, why should we do anything at all? And that's one thing that I've discovered talking to people over all these years is they, they get a tip or they get 
uh, something from one of the auditors and they have what they think is credible evidence that a fraud may have occurred. And so in their mind, they're thinking, well, of course, we're going to conduct an investigation. We're going to go through all of this. But depending on the type of organization and the hierarchy, there may be some pushback from people higher up. So sometimes the first battle for conducting an investigation is to convince somebody up above you that one needs to be conducted in the first place. And again, EI is going to provide um, copies, PDF copies of the slides. So don't worry about trying to, you know, copy all the stuff down. We've got a lot of lists in here. So we're going to give you copies of these. So just kind of sit back and, and look at these and, and think about them as we go through them. So why do you want to do an investigation in the first place? Well, if you have an allegation that, that somebody did something wrong, you should want to figure out, well, what was it? Who was responsible for that? If you have any sense at all, if your company has any uh, morals, then they want to stop it. Nobody should want the fraud to continue. So when you're talking to the general counsel's office, or if you're talking to the board of directors, or you're talking to senior management, you need to, to point these things out. It's like, look, we found something that's wrong. We have to, to look at this. We need to stop it. Second thing is, you need to impress upon them what we do sends a message to the entire company. The first time it really hit hard to me was an interview that I did with a, a guy named Mark Whitaker. And so Mark, uh, pretty uh, big case uh, back, I guess it was in the late 90s, early 2000s. I met Mark uh, about 10 years ago, did an interview with him. And so if you uh, are looking for something to watch on uh, one of the streaming services, the movie The Informant, with Matt Damon was based on his case. Well, Mark was involved with price fixing and he did report that he was a whistleblower to the FBI and they recorded phone conversations and everything to, to prosecute the whistleblower case. But as it turned out, as they were getting ready to go to trial, they found out that Mark was actually stealing money from the company. And the reason that happened is that he was afraid that he was going to get fired. And so he felt like he was making a very good salary. If he gets fired, he's not going to be able to live his current lifestyle. So he needed to steal enough money to live off of. And I couldn't figure out, well, what, what was the mentality? If you're working with the FBI, why would you think you could get away with stealing money in order to live off of. So when I did the interview with him, I asked him that. I said, Mark, what were you thinking? What, what prompted you to steal from an organization? And he didn't steal just a little. He stole eight and a half million dollars from that company while he was wearing a wire for the FBI. So I asked him, I said, Mark, what were you thinking? And he said, well, here it is. A few years earlier, they had caught the treasurer of the company stealing and the treasurer had stolen about $3 million. So when this came out, the organization was looking at it and they were deciding what to do. They did not want the bad publicity. They were doing price fixing among other uh, criminal organization or activities. So they said, fire him, but don't prosecute him, don't sue him civilly, don't go after the money. So they fired the individual, but they did not pursue anything and they never asked for the money back. They never tried to get the money back. They let him keep everything that he stole. So Mark's watching this and he's thinking, oh, now I see how this company operates. They're afraid to do anything. So if I steal money, the worst that can happen is I get fired. But the upside to that is I actually get to keep the money that I stole. So in his mind, he thought that was a, a pretty, you know, good risk. I might get fired, but I, if I can steal eight and a half million dollars, I get to keep that. So that really is a concern when you're talking to people about, are we going to pursue this? Are we going to investigate? Are we going to go forward? Think about the 
people in the organization are going to be watching. And if you think everything's a secret, any of you that work for companies, you know that's not the case. People think, oh, well, this, we've kept this hush hush. Uh, only a couple of people know about it. No, if things uh, filter down through the, the grapevine very quickly, and so people are gonna take a signal from that. And so it does send an important message how you handle these cases. So you need to determine one of the reasons to do investigation is are we at risk? I mean, what is our potential exposure here? If we've committed a crime, have we uh, potentially uh, ripped off our vendors through one of these schemes that they pay more than they were supposed to? So we need to know from a legal standpoint what we're looking at. Also, you can get the money back if you start this soon enough. Um, this is on my mind because we just had our uh, global fraud conference last week. I did an interview with a, a man called uh, Gary Foster. Gary was uh, worked for a city group in New York City, and he stole $22 million while he was working for city group. The good thing is when city found out about it, they did exactly the right thing. They launched an investigation immediately. They followed all the leads. They did everything exactly right. And so because they did things so quickly, they were actually able to freeze his assets, his bank accounts and his property. And, and out of $22 million, they recovered a, a very large portion of that. And the good thing uh, for them in that case was that Gary did not just um, throw it away on frivolous things and in trips. He actually bought hard assets. He bought sports cars, he bought uh, properties. And so because they were able to jump on that so quickly, they were able to secure that and they got most of their money back. It'll stop future losses. If it's continuing, and you start the investigation, then you obviously mitigate your exposure because you shut it down and other potential consequences such as uh, shareholder lawsuits. Uh, if you don't do anything, that can be a, a big problem. We'll talk about that more in a little bit. And strengthening internal controls. Obviously, if not in every case, but in most cases, if you find a, a large fraud, You've got a problem with internal controls. And so that's a good uh, chance to, to go back and look through that whole area. So the first step is we've got to get a, at least a decent idea of what we're looking at. So that's called conducting the initial assessment. And, and I think of it this way, the, the expression in the United States is to, to climb up on a hill and get the lay of the land. So you, you climb up there and you look at everything kind of broadly just to figure out, well, what are we dealing with? Is this, uh, is this a bribe case? If it is bribes, are they foreign government officials? So that means that we're dealing with a uh, potential, you know, uh, Foreign Corrupt Practice Act in the US or UK Bribery Act in the UK. Most countries have a similar act that or uh, law that says it's illegal to bribe foreign officials to obtain business. So that's what the, the kind of scope you wanna figure out what are we dealing with. And so it's at this point, it's just limited. We're trying to get a basic idea of what we're dealing with so we know which one of these different roads to go down. So next slide. And then that continues because here's what we're trying to do in the uh, assessment. First of all, we, we want to determine, well, did a fraud occur? Now, sometimes when you get whistleblower calls or the auditor finds some uh, anomaly or something unusual, if you do a little bit of initial research, you can figure out, well, it, it doesn't look like it rises to the level of fraud. It could be that it was a mistake or they misunderstood the reporting procedures or something you know, fell through the cracks ad, accidentally. So that can kind of help you determine, are we really looking at fraud or could it be kind of on the, on the fence, on the edge? What's the status? Status kind of goes to, you know, is it, uh, is it still occurring? 
is it is this person gone is it over with or do we think that this is an ongoing risk we can kind of at this point uh, start to look uh, review any I'm sorry we can go back to uh, review any applicable policies or procedures one of the most uh, people often overlook the easiest route the easiest route to discipline someone and then if you if you find evidence of wrongdoing ultimately uh, fire them or let them go is that they violated a company policy or procedure often people immediately jump to have they committed a crime are we going to call in the criminal authorities are we going to go after them criminally but a lot of times the you need to step up you need to step back and look at the most basic thing, which is, did they violate some company policy or procedure? And it can be even simple things like taking gifts from vendors. So you have a purchasing manager, they fly uh, to Hawaii, and you're thinking, well, they, you know, oh, I don't think they really had the means to do that. That was an expensive trip. And you start looking into it, it may be just a question of they took uh, a gift from a vendor, they took tickets to Hawaii. Now, the problem with prosecuting that criminally in many, many parts of the world, including many states in the United States, that's not a crime. Now, it isn't in the United Kingdom. They specifically uh, outlined com outlawed commercial bribery, but in the United States, it's uh, it depends on the state. But in in Texas, where I live, that's not illegal. So just because it's as long as it's just a gift, and there was no uh, manipulating prices, the company didn't lose any money. That's not necessarily illegal. So that's why you've got to look and find out well whatever the potential conduct is. Could it be a violation of our company policies and procedures? So if that's the case, then the, one of the best routes is to go through there and just terminate the person for violating the policy. You don't have to prove that uh, any quid pro quo, as they say. You don't have to prove that they gave them the business because they gave them the tickets to Hawaii. Because sometimes that's very hard to do. It could be that they awarded the contract and then after the fact, they get the tickets. Again, that may not be illegal, but if you have the proper policies in place, it should be against the company policy. So that way you can discipline them for not following the policy and you don't have to get into all of the, the legal uh, issues there. Identifying claims or offenses. And we'll talk more about that in a second. We'll also talk more about uh, determining the scope. We mentioned the status. So this is, you know, kind of where are we at? So the initial assessment, here's some of the questions that you hope to answer just at the very beginning. You want to try and figure out as much as you can, when did it start? Uh, Gary Foster, um, I mentioned Gary. Gary was working for Citigroup, stole $22 million over four or five years, but he had worked there, I think a total of 11 or 12 years before he left, but he had been working there for, for four or five years before he ever started to steal. But once they found that he had transferred money from a city account into his own personal bank account, then they had to figure out, well, how far back? So they, they were going to have to go back and potentially look, the scope could potentially go, potentially go back all the way to when he was first hired because we just don't know. So that's one of the things you're going to have to put on your list. If the person's been there 12 years, you may have to assume it's been going on that long. Uh, where did the violation come from? Uh, part of assessing, was it a whistleblower complaint? Was it uh, internal audit? Was it external audit? And we won't get into uh, this here in the time that we have, but if, you know, you really do have to stop and think about whistleblower uh, tips. Uh, it, the report to the nations, uh, 
every year since we started asking that question in since uh, the year 2000, the last 20 years, we've asked, how did you find out about this fraud? And the overwhelming answer is through a tip. Somebody saw something, they noticed something, and they let the company nut and the company uh, looked into it. But as you know, just because you get a tip, that doesn't mean it's correct. It could be the person's disgruntled or they don't understand the facts. They don't understand the issues involved. So you really do have to stop and think if this came from an anonymous whistleblower, we need to, to tread lightly. That doesn't necessarily mean that something happened. Was it um, something that came externally or internally? And do we think the fraud was occurring internally or externally? And we'll talk about that more later. Is it still ongoing? If the person's still working there and they're still doing that same job, you have to have the, the mentality to think that uh, this could be happening right as we speak and to take that into your planning process. And if it's no longer occurring, when did it stop? So that's one of the issues If the person, like in the instance of Gary Foster, he left and they found this out after he was gone. These are in my mind and, and um, I was an attorney in private practice, as I mentioned before I came to the ACFE, when I started the ACFE, we were smaller. I was their general counsel. I was also uh, writing, especially uh, course material, fraud examiner's manual, exam questions, even with the legal section. So I'm definitely, my uh, background is in the law. So that's why I have always stressed these two things. If you've ever taken one of my uh, exam review classes, this is one of the biggest things that I harp on. At the early stage, you have no clue where this is going to hit. I was a terrible, when I was in private practice and people would come to me with a problem, we did a lot of deceptive trade practices, we dealt a lot of consumer fraud, um, business fraud and so people would come and they would give me tell me their story at the initial meeting and i was the worst predictor about well is oh this sounds so easy there's no way they're not we, we can prove them uh, that they did it absolutely this is going to be the easiest thing in the world to prove uh, they're going to admit to it and give us the money back and those were always the cases that ended up going to, to court. I, I was a, never could predict this. So you have to assume litigation will follow. So everything that you do, you have to be thinking, if I were called to a witness stand and I'm in the dock, as they call it in the UK, and you're standing there in the dock and they you raise your hand and you swear to tell the truth, and attorneys start questioning you about what you did and why you did it. Can you hold up under that? Uh, can you point to you know, everything you did, you had a reason for, and you, you did things from the outset to help yourself out. For example, things like uh, uh, creating memorandum of interviews. So you do an interview and you think, well, this is probably going to go nowhere. I'm busy. I can remember what happened. I took a couple of notes and you go on down the road. It could be a year before you realize we're headed to court. They sued you, you sued them. The uh, criminal authorities came in. Now there's going to be a criminal investigation. And so if you're going to try and go back and document that interview a year later, it's not going to be a pretty sight. So assuming litigation will follow involves lots of things. It's everything you do, you need to make sure that you document it, that you write things down, that you have a reason for it. And so that to me is one of the most extremely important things that you need to be thinking through the whole time. And then predication. If you, watch the, the crime shows and, and you like those, they talk about predication that really came from criminal law enforcement. If they had predication to obtain a search warrant or they had predication to bring someone in for an interview or predication to arrest someone. But predication is important even if you're just doing an internal case. 
The reason is there is a difference between you have the legal right to do something and you have predication to do it. And I've used this example in some of the classes I teach. It's kind of a, a basic, but I think it brings the, the, the point home. So let's say your company has the best legal team in the world. They wrote out a, a bulletproof policy that says under all applicable laws, we have the right to look at employees' email. It's, we have done everything that's required to do as far as notices and policies and signing and everything else. So there is no question about that the organization has the legal right to look in someone's email. That's a separate issue from did you have proper predication to do that? So let's say I work as an investigator and we're getting on the elevator in the morning and you bump into me and you don't say, excuse me. And you think, well, that was rude. And you might not have even been wearing a mask, which is even more rude under uh, all these circumstances. So you're thinking, well, wait a minute. I don't think I like this person. This person's not following the rules. They're rude. You know what? I think I'm going to go in their email this afternoon and look around and see if I can find something that they've done wrong. And then I'm going to open an investigation and see if I can get them fired. If you do that, you're going to have a problem. Why? Because you didn't have sufficient predication to go into their email in the first place. Going into someone's email, regardless of whether you have all the legal policies in place, that's extremely invasive. That's one of the most invasive things that you can do. So before I start going through someone's email, I want to be able to know that I have a complete explanation of why this was necessary. That this was, uh, we had tips, we had complaints, there were um, irregularities in order to confirm these facts or to refute these facts. We needed to go into the person's email and look through that. It is, you, every step that you take, you really just need to think, do we have a business reason to do that. All right, next slide. Now, I'll, I will be perfectly frank with you here. I am not a big flow chart person. So I, when I do anything, investigations or things like that, I, the, my first thought is not, is never, well, let's sit down and do a flow chart. I probably should, I think it's a good practice, but this came out of the uh, fraud examiner's manual. And so you'll also see it in, in the larger version if you download the, uh, the slide, but this came out of the manual. But if you do like flow charts, and I know many of you are accountants and auditors, and just in my experience, accounting and auditors love flow charts. So if that helps, by all means use this. So, you know, we're talking about starting with the initial predication of just uh, should we do, we have enough information here to conduct an investigation. So you kind of start with, with it, was it a tip or a complaint? And so you can use this to um, write a more formal fraud response plan, if you like, but it's a very, um, it's a very good chart about thinking through the different steps. So you want to evaluate the tip. Do you think it's credible? So that you ask the question, is there, is predication sufficient here? Was there enough in the tip to warrant that? Yes, we do think something may have happened. So if there, if it is yes, then you're going to go on. If it's no, then you stop, but you do the same thing with, with whatever it is, is there accounting clues, the auditors, uh, internal audit spotted something, external audit spotted something, or some other uh, source that came forward. So the first idea is, you know, wherever the initial oh, allegation came from, is there sufficient predication to move forward? So if there is, you're going to go down, and now we're going to talk about the, you know, the fraud theory, 
And these are basic investigative questions. I'm going to run through all of these, but it's the, you know, who could be involved, what could have happened, uh, why the allegation might be true, uh, how could they have concealed it, when did it take place, how is the fraud being perpetrated. So these are all these uh, initial questions that you're going to sit down and you're going to go through. But because it's, you know, each what the steps involved are going to be different for each uh, type of fraud. I'm not going to spend a lot of time going uh, through each of those. They're pretty uh, self-explanatory and you can use that uh, for yourself, but determine, you know, is it an on book? Is it off book? Uh, who all could be involved or what uh, other witnesses could be there? And then fraud theory, if you is simply, there's more in it in the fraud examiner's manual, but it's really just basic scientific method. You come up with a theory, you test it. If that doesn't seem to be panning out or that doesn't seem to be working, what do you do? Well, you go back and you revise your theory and you start again. And then it's helpful early on to prepare charts, linking people and evidence. There are a lot of software products out there that will do this for you. Again, in the fraud examiner's manual, there's a whole section there on talking about link analysis programs. Um, I2 Analyst Notebook is a good one, but you can draw link charts in PowerPoint. So it's not, it's not that you necessarily have to go out and buy anything, but you can create uh, uh, this with off the you know, uh, programs you already have and determine possible defenses. You might have start thinking, well, and we'll get into this more in a second. Uh, can you prove it? Do they have, you know, can you prove that it was intentional and not an accident? And then you've got to stop and ask this question, is evidence sufficient to proceed? So you've looked at this and you think, let's take a example of a purchasing manager. So you have a purchasing manager, you've got a tip, that they were uh, taking bribes from vendors in order to give them business. And you talk to everybody, you look at the books and records, and if you don't, if you can't find any evidence of that, and you can't uh, see any unusual pattern in the way the bids are awarded or the way things are purchased, then you may not have enough evidence to, to proceed. And if that's the case, then you want to stop. That doesn't mean you can't pick it up again later, but if you don't, you've got to ask yourself, do you have predication to keep moving forward? And if the answer is yes, then you conduct investigation. And all the things that are involved with this, again, there's a whole chapter in the, the manual that talks about how to do the interviews and the document examination, all the observations. So let's go on to the next part of this. And again, this comes from the, the lawyer side of me, which is you have to keep your eye on the ball. If you are going to say something is fraud, fraud has a legal definition. So you've got to differentiate early on between inadvertent violations and those carried out with deliberate criminal intent. And so one of the ways to do this is can you prove this wasn't a mistake? So the, the saying is fraud is not an accident. It's not. If, uh, if you are going to prove fraud, and this is whether it's in a civil court or a criminal court, doesn't make any difference. You have to prove that they knew what they were doing at the time that they did it. So if you're not sure, or you can't, you don't have any evidence that you found so far, that this person knew that what they were doing was wrong or against policy, then you're going to have a problem. And, and that may uh, determine which road you go down and how you pursue it. It may be that you want to just stick with a violation of a policy that they didn't get these uh, things approved. And these are things like um, 
let's take a you know travel expense or travel entertainment expenses uh, or personal reimbursements for things. Uh, well, and this happened to me. We we were we did a training in Seattle, and uh, they have the coolest thing there. It's and we were doing a training uh, for Amazon, and in the bottom of Amazon headquarters, they have a store called Amazon Go. And so what happens is you go in and you you put in your credit card and you sign up in advance. And when you go in the store, you scan your phone and it knows who you are. You take a shopping bag, you go around and you pick up, it's like a convenience store. You pick up items like a sandwich or a bag of chips or a soda. You put it in the bag and you walk out with it. And there's wireless I do not understand the technology. There are cameras, it's tracking you, it tracks the item. So you put that in there and you walk out the door. So there's two examples I can come up with this. One is I had to put in a credit card to do that. So I use, we were, uh, Bruce Doris and I were there. We were going to just grab lunch to see how this works. So we go into the Amazon Go store. I have my company credit card uh, in there. We buy lunch, we put it in the bag, and then we walk out with it. So later I went back and I was telling my son about it and he thought it was really cool. So they have some mugs uh, there that you can buy. So I went in and I bought a mug and a couple of souvenirs and everything. And I walked back out with it. And it wasn't until after I got the, the credit card statement that I realized I'd, I'd never changed the credit card. It was still on my company car. So is that a fraud? Well, it's certainly a violation of policy. I record, uh, you know, I charge personal items to a company credit card, but was it intentional? No, I just happened to have that in there. I, the, I, it never even occurred to me that it was, I had to go in and switch out the credit cards. The other thing is, you know, proving intent from the point of Amazon. Let's say I put something in the bag and I walk out and it doesn't record it. Did I steal it? Well, I didn't pay for the item, but I was under the impression, according to the instructions from the store, that you don't, it's, this is automatic. If you put it in the bag and you walk out, it's supposed to do it automatically. So that's what we're talking about uh, with intent. Can you prove that this was done intentionally, that it was not an accident? And if you can't, then you may have to go with something lower like violation of a policy. So you need to take into account, can you prove, now if I had tried to hide that expense or lie about what it was for, then yes, that, that's evidence that I might have actually intended to do that from the start because I tried to uh, hide, I tried to delete the receipt or I tried to cover up what, was, uh, what the items were. I lied about it when I was asked. Uh, anything that you can uh, point to where it looks like they were lying or trying to cover something up, that you can go to prove it wasn't a mistake because they took active steps to try and hide. All right, next part. I mentioned this a couple of different ways. There are a number of things you've got to consider if you're going the legal route. One is, um, potential legal claims and uh, offenses, including you can go after them civilly. If someone uh, steals money from you, you can sue them in civil court, but you've got to, depending on the location you're in, you may have to pay your attorneys and hope that you can maybe get an award for attorney's fees on the other side. So that can be expensive. So you, wanna, you may wanna go the criminal route, but if it's a criminal case, then you're gonna have to prove all the elements of a, the offense. You're gonna have to get the prosecutor to go along with you. So the reason you wanna, you wanna think about this early on is what type of evidence are you going to have to have to go each of these different routes? If you want the, the person, uh, if you wanna sue them, and you want to pursue them criminally, then you're going to have to have the right types of evidence. And you may want to meet with attorneys earning early on, and they can tell you, here's what you need to move forward. Administrative or things like, um, if you're a publicly traded company, 
you find out that somebody was engaged in related party transactions. Well, under most jurisdictions, you have to report that. And if you don't report it, then that's a violation. It's an administrative violation, but it's still there. So you may need to uh, report that to uh, the securities regulators and let them know what happens and they might want to go after that person on a civil violation. And then another thing is don't forget to check your insurance. You may have insurance that covers this. Auto companies have fidelity policies or fidelity bonds that covers uh, employee misconduct. So if you, you uh, Citibank, for example, and I don't know all the conditions of their uh, insurance at the time, but it, they were a financial institution. They had an employee who was stealing from them. Uh, my understanding from talking to Gary is that yes, they did have insurance protection. They contacted, they worked with the insurance company, but the insurance company told them, here's what we're going to need to pay off on these claims. Uh, scope, we've mentioned a lot of this already. I, I'm just going to hit this um, at a very high level. The thing is, you just got to, you know, be alert early on as to how far are you going to need to go with this? Is this, you think this is really an isolated case, like in the instance of uh, Gary Foster at City, it was. This was not widespread. It was simply he was wiring money to his personal bank account and he was covering it up. No one else was involved. This was not a widespread problem. But if you have uh, like uh, Wells Fargo, for example, when Wells Fargo first discovered that they had in order to, if you remember the story very quickly, they had um, slogan eight is great. Employees had to, were encouraged is a nice word, but some say that they were, they were strongly encouraged and it affected their job performance that they needed to sign up all of their customers with eight different uh, accounts, like credit card accounts, loan accounts, home equity accounts, that kind of thing. So when they first started getting into this and looked into it, uh, this wasn't isolated to two or three employees in one branch. When they started looking into this, they realized this was rampant throughout the entire country, that, that many of their branches so that's the kind of thing once you get into it and you find out, well, these employees at this one location are doing something uh, to try and get around this policy, you have, and you have a thousand branches, you're going to have to expand that scope to start looking uh, everywhere. And some of that depends really on what type of company you have. Again, Citibank is an, and Citigroup, a uh, very high level, very upstanding company. Uh, they could determine quickly it was located to one person. But think about if you were working on the Enron case and you started digging around uh, looking at Enron, they were, uh, they were corrupt from top to bottom. They weren't just doing financial statement fraud schemes. They were doing all kinds of stuff. And so that you were gonna to have to do a scope on a larger scale to kind of go a lot broader than that. And it's like, it, it's not just financial statement fraud we've got to think about. We need to be looking at everything management's doing because it looks like they're corrupt in everything that they do. And then you got to think about who all is involved and create your list. Uh, let's go to the next slide. There's another, there's more on here. We've talked about how important it is to look to see, do you have policies that prohibit this? Can you actually show that they've done something wrong? Uh, are you going to, and we've mentioned this again as well, if uh, we're going to try and uh, go after them civilly, but it also you need to think about, are you going to be sued civilly? If you're a publicly traded company and there's any kind of wrongdoing did, I can assure you the lawyers are already thinking, well, we're going to be sued by the shareholders and they're going to claim a uh, breach of duty or negligence or that we did something that caused losses in the company uh, and they, they're going to need to start looking into this and considering if, if um, 
we need what evidence and, and what they need to do to defend these lawsuits. And then always, you know, think about negative publicity. It's always a concern about uh, how far you're going to go with this and what the implications are. Uh, financial ramifications is simply beyond the loss of the company. Did we, did anybody else lose money? For example, if it was a bad purchasing manager, was he overcharging some of the customers? If that's true, then well, now you're going to have to go back and you're going to have to look to see if uh, you owe refunds or did you uh, do something improper there. Um, now, Gary Foster stole from these were not customer accounts. These were Citigroup investment accounts. But let's say he had been stealing from customer accounts. Well, that's a problem because what you owe these customers money. Now you're going to have to go back and you're going to have to consider, uh, do you owe people money? You're going to have to credit their accounts and are there tax implications? Did you pay, uh, too little taxes because they were, um, hiding revenues and they were moving around in different quarters. So you're going to have to look to see, do you owe the taxing authority money? But the good news is if you over, they overflated their uh, revenues, you may get a tax refund, but it's at least something you need to look into. Let's see this next uh, slide. Next issue is talking about um, confidentiality. Get caught up. So confidentiality, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, next, there we go. And this is just talk to the lawyers. Uh, we're not going to get into all the ins and outs. Uh, it depends on the jurisdiction. It depends on the type of investigation. My advice is always as a lawyer, bring the lawyers in early. If you have the lawyers directing the investigation, some of this may uh, come under attorney client privilege. It may come under uh, attorney work product. And again, that can be important. We just talked about shareholder lawsuits or lawsuits by customers. So that's another reason that you, you may need to be working with counsel just to make sure that you're uh, gathering this up, you're protecting it as much as possible. The next two slides are just talking about assembling the team. You no need to belabor this. It's just the idea of, uh, you need to stop and think as you get into this, who do we need as part of our core team? And this could change as you, as you discover more. And uh, it could be lawyers, auditors, the audit committee, if it's a, fine, if it's a um, publicly traded com uh, company, security, compliance people, goes on into the next list. And there's uh, building security, maybe cameras, management, IT, uh, computer forensics. This is not, it's a lot of people here. It's not even an exhaustive list. It, uh, but the idea is simply stop and think, do we need to bring in some experts uh, to help us out? And I will say IT and computer forensics, you're definitely gonna, probably gonna have to have uh, some of those people in there. You know, available and I'll talk about that in the next slide, which is or wait, no, it's a, far, a little farther down. External notifications. Who else do we need to notify? Uh -oh. If it's a uh, regulatory issue, you may need to immediately notify, and that depends on what the rules are that uh, you're reporting. The, for example, publicly traded company, let's just take the Securities Exchange Commission, SEC, you filed your 10 Qs and 10 Ks and all these reports, and now you have, have uh, all good evidence to suggest that they were incorrect. Then you're gonna have to contact the SEC very quickly and tell them we have a problem. We're gonna have to be submitting uh, amended reports. They wanna know that right away. Again, we talked about is there insurance, but you know how insurance companies work. They want to be notified immediately of what the potential claims are so they can be involved with the investigation. Uh, notification of customers or vendors. 
if it's a, a you're sure it's a violation as part uh, like paying bribes in violation of one of the anti-bribery laws, then you may want to call law enforcement uh, right away and say, look, we found this, we want to cooperate with you immediately. So you need to stop and think through all of these. And if it's a, a data breach, if it involves compromised uh, information from your customers or vendors, then you may have an obligation to notify those people. And I kind of also internally, go, let's go to internal notifications. Who all within the organization do you need to know? Now we have all the data privacy concerns and uh, GDPR in uh, the UK and all of the countries that deal with the companies in the UK. You need to stop and think, who do we need to notify internally to either to uh, gather the information or that needs to be uh, involved in, you can't just get employee files anymore. You can't, if you need employee files now, you have to be thinking, well, is this in compliance with GDPR? What are the purposes? How's the information kept? So it, it, you know, it takes a small village to run an investigation because you've got to bring in, um, all of these different teams and all of these in, uh, different individuals. So that's why it's a, a good reason to make contacts with these people and know who your friends are. Next slide is talking about availability of records. Just remember there's internal records, there's external records and how you get those and make sure that you do these uh, properly, make sure that, um, you don't destroy them. You uh, litigation holds are now pretty much a worldwide thing. You may need to notify people within the organization right away. That's like, look, uh, we may be involved with litigation with this organization, with these people. We need to preserve these records right away. Courts around the world do not take uh, kindly to destruction of evidence. So if you have electronic records and you have a credible allegation that there was a fraud and you do not take uh, steps to preserve that information, then you could be in trouble down the road. That's a, another reason why you want to get the lawyers involved and the IT people to decide what do we have and how do we uh, preserve that. And then just some final thoughts as you go uh, through this. Stay in touch with your team. You need to meet regularly, make sure that everybody knows what everybody else is doing. Document, document, document. Everything that you do, make sure that you're writing it down when it happens uh, so that later on people know. It's like, yes, this is, we can uh, prove each step because sometimes that's going to be a key. If you're sued or you're being pursued by the regulatory authorities, they're wanna, going to want to know, well, what did you do at each stage? And as long as you can document that you did everything properly, when you found an allegation, you investigated, you wrote down and documented what you did, you should be okay. But if you didn't write any of that down, you're gonna have a trouble. Make sure that your staff are aware of the goals, what we're doing, what are their timelines, keeping management notified. Somebody above you is going to be making the final decision. They don't like to be caught off guard. So keep them in the loop. Uh, make sure they get regular reports. Meet with the attorneys frequently. Keep them apprised of what's going on. They may see something that you don't, can help you guide uh, you in the right uh, direction. And then again, keep uh, confidentiality on your mind at all times. Lock up the files at night. Make sure you're careful about who you're uh, sending information to, particularly by email. So that was a lot uh, there, but you, you kind of get the general gist of it. You've got the slides. You can go back and you can go through all of that. Uh, we still have some, some if there's some questions, I'm happy to take any of those. If I saw some um, out there that I didn't have a, a chance to get to.
Thank you very much for the amazing uh, presentation. I'm getting all the feedback from all our delegates and they are really excited you know, to, uh, to, to be with you because so many of them, they can't travel to US in the same way you can travel to their uh, home city. And at the same time, they are really, really taking notes. Some of them, they say, we are taking notes. <laughs> so some of them, they need to watch it again also because it's really valuable for them to understand all these important points. You know, I always tell them when we are doing investigation, this is not like a marketing strategy. In case it will not work out, we try again. Sometimes there are legal implications. Sometimes, you know, you as a fraud investigator, you are going to have a legal case against you if you don't do it in the proper way. You're absolutely right. I mean, you do have to, you know, go back to one of those first uh, things, assume litigation will follow and uh, assume that you may be, you know, I tell people, think about everything you do. And if you are in the witness stand and you have to explain, here's why I did it. Do you have a, a, a reason to do all of that? And, and as long as you had a reason to do it, then you're you're fine. I mean, uh, if you just follow the rules, you should be you should be okay. Now uh, we have uh, some time for some questions, so I'm going to go over with you over these questions. If you have any question, you can ask in the question and answer. The first question I have here, they are uh, saying, you know, the same way you know IIA they have internal audit standards and in accounting. We have the uh, IFRS and the, the GAAP in US. Do we have globally any, uh, you know, investigation standards that fraud examiners should actually follow when they are conducting fraud examination by ACFE or globally? There are some broad standards and there is a CFE code of professional standards and you can get that on the ACFE.com uh, website. I think it's under fraud resources. Uh, it could also be under about us because there's the code of ethics which talks about uh, ethical responsibilities but there is also a code of professional standards now it's very broad and it, and it basically says do a good job consider everything uh, you know uh, be competent in the investigation the, when we were working with the standards committee to write out this to write this out we didn't want to go too detailed because the problem is, as you can tell, it depends on the type of case that you're dealing with. And so we didn't say, well, in each case, you have to do this, you have to do this, you have to do this. So they're broader about, you know, how you approach it and some guidelines about, you know, things that you need to think about. But uh, it's definitely worth uh, having a look at the professional standards uh, just kind of to see uh, what level they're at and make sure that whatever you are doing um, follows that. So that, that's a great point. Great question. All right. I have another question here. They are saying, is it legally to do a recording during an interview related to investigation? It depends. That's the old lawyer answer, isn't it? It's like uh, everything is, if you ask a lawyer any question, the standard answer is it depends. ACFE does not take a position on whether you have to record interviews or not, because it can vary so much by uh, country, even within in the United States, it sometimes depends on what state you're in. So we leave that up to the organization. There is no rule against it. So if it's legal where you're at and you think that uh, it can uh you can do a better job of documenting the interview by recording it, then there's absolutely nothing wrong with that, but there is no requirement either way. All right, thank you very it's much. up to the person. Thank you. There's another interesting question. They are saying, you know, based on your experience and interviewing all these uh, fraudsters, do you have any interesting case related to a, a mistake that fraud examiner did when he is planning for the investigation or conducting the investigation that allowed the fraudster to run away or you know, they were not able to take action against him, if you can recall any? Well, there is one, the first one that just popped in my head, this was an interview that Jim Riley did many years ago and I've never forgotten it. it was, um, he was caught later doing some things, but he was telling a story about the first time he stole money and he worked for a bank and someone came in and they made a deposit and he put the, the, the physical deposit, he put the money uh, down under his desk 
and he never recorded it and he took the money and he put it in his pocket and he went home. And so it was uh, weeks later when the, the customer found out that, that they weren't credit with that, they started looking, they discovered when Tom, he was like, well, I don't know, you know, Tom Hughes is the guy's name. Uh, he didn't know anything about it. And so they sent in a team of investigators and they started interviewing him. And one of the interviewers said, I know what happened. You hid that money in the break room. And then at the end of the day, you went back and you uh, took that out of the break room and you put it in your bag and you walked out with it. And we have security and all that. And he real, and so Tom said, I was on the verge of confessing. But when he told that story, that was not what happened at all. It, it didn't. He said, I, I hid the money in a different spot and I, I took it earlier. And he said, at that point, I realized they're guessing. They do not know what happened. They are, that's their theory, but they're wrong. And so he said, I was about to confess, but when I realized they had the wrong theory, he said, I just stopped. And they, he got away with it and nobody ever found out about it. Later at another bank, he was stealing money and he did get caught that time. So that is taught me a valuable lesson is if you are not sure of exactly what happened, don't throw your crazy theories out when you're doing the, the interviews. If you're just, you know, hold that at bay, because if you are wrong, you will blow the entire thing. So, you know, be smart about it. Uh, try and get the information from them, but just don't go off on your, you know, half cock theories if you're not absolutely sure that's what happened. Because they know. They know what happened. So if you're not sure, you better not go down that route. Yeah, I completely agree with you. We have a case similar happened in Dubai where actually they told the guy what he supposed that he, he had done in this uh, fraud case. And the guy, he said, yes, I have done it. So then they took actually his statement and they actually uh, uh, took it in his handwriting and they submitted to court. When they went to the court, his attorney came and he said, if we compare the facts of the fraud incident with the statement of my client, they are not matching. So how come that my client is saying something not matching with the actual facts of the case? And then they said, my client was under the pressure, whatever the investigator told him, he exactly said yes. This is what happened because he was afraid. And they actually took the case without verifying that with the facts that they have. <laughs> so they lost the case. And the guy was actually doing exactly what, what happened, but he didn't tell them uh, exactly his method. Yeah. No, that's a, that's a, that's an awesome example. That's exactly right. If, if you, if they write something out and that's not at all what happened and then they're like, well, see, they forced me to write this and, Oh, no, that's, that's, a, that's a great example. There's a very interesting movie called The Interview. If you have watched it on uh, Netflix, it will explain exactly to you, you know, all this methodology of investigation and, you know, predication and all these ideas. And the, 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 the script, I'm not going to tell you the end of the movie, but the idea of the movie that they uh, took a guy to the interview room and they are doing an interview with him. And they use completely against all the concept that you are speaking about, about how they need to ask, about how they need to do the proper work. And at the end, you know, the guy actually told them, yes, I did it. And he was the actual guy, but he was able to run away from the process. If, if you see the movie, you see how, because he was able to understand all the legal gaps in the work of the investigator that he can use against him. So even he did it, and even they have the evidence against him because they used the wrong approach, the guy was able to run away. That's why, you know, and all, everything that we talked about up until now, it's, it's un, you have got to uncover the facts and you've got to match up with well, what does the suspect say with the facts that you found in your, your investigation? Because if you just start out with, uh, you go in and you'd get an admission seeking interview and they confess to it. And then you think, well, I've got him to confess. My case is solid. You're wrong. Cause you just gave two great examples of why that's not the case. You have got to do all of those other steps that we just talked about so that, you know, whatever they're telling you is true or false. They may tell you 
They may confess to something that's false and then try and claim that, uh, uh, that well, you were trying to frame them or you pressure them into signing something. So you've got to know the facts before you start doing uh, some of the interviews. Exactly. I always uh, tell them, you know, when I teach the CFP review courses in the same way, fraudsters, they actually have a game plan to do the fraud. We need to have a game plan, a strategy, a fraud investigation strategy to go around, you know, the concepts. And I always tell them, it's always not the direct approach. You don't bring someone and you say, okay, tell me what happened. You need to understand how indirectly you can collect all the information, how indirectly you can make him come with the information that you need. Because using the direct approach where we say, okay, we bring the guy, we look at the evidence, that's gonna reflect badly on your investigation. Absolutely, good point. Thank you so much. We have, I think, more than 53 questions, but we don't have time to go <laughs> over them. <laughs> so we will- we Well, will, good, we'll, you were, that meant you all were paying attention and you were listening, so good for you. Yes, uh, actually we have more than, I think, uh, 1,300 they are attending us on different platforms live. So <laughs> thank you so much for you know, this amazing uh, webinar. We are glad that you are with us you know, from um, uh, Texas and hopefully next time you'll be with us here in Dubai uh, live. Uh, I maybe. hope so, sometime to, to meet some of you in person. I, I love to travel, hope to see you. Definitely. So this will conclude our session. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for all the international uh, uh, ACFE chapters for supporting us. And thank you, uh, Mr. John, for actually being our special guest speaker. You're, I'm very honored. Thank you for having me.